WCBI News at 6 starts now. Good evening, everyone. A Winston County teenager has been shot to death, and investigators now have a suspect in custody. WCBI's Quentin Smith has been in Winston County most of the afternoon. He joins us now live with the latest. Andrea, the suspect in today's shooting, 18 year old Jared Hanna of Louisville, is being charged with murder and is currently behind bars here at the Winston County Correctional Facility. Now, the victim in today's shooting is 18 year old Katavis Malik Miller. This all unfolded just before 11 o'clock this morning on a young crossing road. Coroner Sky Gregory says the victim received multiple gunshot wounds and had to be rushed to the hospital where he later died. Now, the victim, Miller, he was a standout athlete at Noxipater High School where he starred on the football field as well as the basketball court. Winston County Sheriff Jason Pugh says Miller and the suspect did know one another. He says the two got into an argument which eventually led to the gunfire. Sheriff says Hannah was arrested and taken into custody just before 3 o'clock this afternoon. Our officers received some information that he might possibly be at a residence at the end of Obie Shields Road in our county. They obtained permission from the homeowner to look in the residence, and Mr. Hannah was hiding in the top of a closet. It looks like maybe a 40 caliber handgun was used in it. Uh, I think it was some kind of a, maybe a domestic dispute. Uh, from what I could tell, uh, it could be as many as two gunshot wounds. Uh, I do know that uh, the, the fatal wound was uh, in his uh, upper chest area. Uh, and uh, actually, there was no exit wound, just an entrance wound. So. Now, Sheriff Pugh says he does not expect any more arrests to be made in connection with this shooting. He also says Hannah is expected to be arraigned on tomorrow. But for now, reporting live in Winston County, Quentin Smith, WCBI News. A West Alabama pursuit comes into Lowndes County and ends near Steens. Clint Miner of Vernon is charged with felony eluding law enforcement in Lowndes County. Millport Police Chief Charles White says he caught Miner speeding. As White approached Miner's car, the Toyota Corolla took off. Lowndes County investigators say the chase went into Steens and, se and several uh, county roads before ending on Highway 12. A female passenger was not charged. White says Miner will be charged with two counts of speeding, attempting to elude reckless driving and reckless endangerment in Alabama. Time now to turn things over to Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson. He joins us with a first look at our forecast. Joy, not too bad of an evening here in downtown Louisville, Mississippi, right here. You can see the uh, clouds, the little breaks we have out there. It was a decent day. No real rain showers around here. Those have been suppressed to the south. There has been some rain in the clouds, but not really reaching the ground, and we don't really have to worry about it for this evening. Temperatures currently in the lower 60s in many spots as we get into this evening. More than the way of 50s, lows tonight down into the 40s. Back up to around 70 tomorrow. Still a lot of cloud cover. Can't rule out a few isolated showers, though. The full forecast coming up. Well, floodwaters are beginning to recede in Lowndes County, but it's not fast enough for some residents. Many are having to get creative to find ways in and out of their neighborhoods. WCBI's Stephanie Poole joins us live in the studio with more. Stephanie? Yes, sink or swim. That's what residents in Lowndes County say when dealing with the aftermath of the floods. It's really pouring it on in North Mississippi. This sinkhole appeared in Plymouth Road in Lowndes County, leaving residents like Carrie Perriton to find new ways in and out. We've had to walk out, and I had to walk through water in front of Plymouth Baptist Church to get to this main road. I'm going to have to walk home and back until they can um, get the road fixed. Almost immediately, the road caved in, so people that wanted to get their vehicles out could not. Due to the sinkhole, one elderly resident says she hasn't been able to get her medical deliveries. But that's not the only area underwater. Residents on Spurlock Road and further down are relying on boats to stay afloat. There's no way to get in to our neighborhood. It's pretty much landlocked from water. We got some neighbors that's needing supplies and stuff. They have to fit food, water, and whatever else can fit. Most have family or friends helping them ship their supplies in. And some are also out providing more support to their friends, letting them know they're not forgotten. We're just trying to see what we can do to lend a helping hand, you know, not only to the people inside the city limit, but you know, the people that's in the county area that's affected by this water also. People have been donating a lot of stuff and like say, you know, we're going to try to do what we can to, you know, help out our neighbors. 
Residents are keeping a close eye on the waters, waiting for their roads to clear. Lieutenant Governor Tate Reeves rides through Columbus today to see all of the damage firsthand. He toured uh, some of the area's hardest hit by Saturday's tornado. Reeves praised the community support and has been talking to Governor Phil Bryant and MEMA Director Greg Michelle about the city receiving federal disaster relief. And he feels optimistic about that happening. Uh, I think we're headed in the right direction uh, with the, the FEMA because when a uh, a natural disaster occurs like this. Uh, it takes a partnership. It takes a partnership between the federal government, between state government, and most importantly between talented, competent individuals at the local level. And uh, this certainly is an area in which that is um, certainly the case. Governor Phil Bryant is scheduled to visit Columbus tomorrow. Well, just imagine having no power, no phone, no real connection to the outside world. Many tornado victims in Columbus have been telling us that's exactly how they feel. And they are getting information by word of mouth, but some of it is incorrect. Today, our Jory Tally talks to one lady who needed help figuring out where to go next. Jory's in the studio with that story. Disaster response teams are in town to help, but sometimes in a disaster, you don't know what to ask or where to go. It can be frustrating, discouraging, but I talked to one lady that is not giving up. People just don't understand. Once you go through stuff like this, you, know, you hurt. And then you go to people and you ask them for help. You know, that would stop people from wanting to ask people for help because you get so many no's. They throw up so many blocks back. Shirley Ferguson is thankful to be alive and to see another birthday today. However, just days after an EF3 tornado demolished her Railroad Street apartment, she's still lost. They all just said, well, I sympathize with y'all. We understand what you're going through. I, do you understand how I feel? I don't have no clothes. I don't. I don't have my roof on my head. I don't have nothing. And on top of being left with nothing, Ferguson feels helpless. I hate asking people for help. But then when, when I do come out of care and ask people for help, you keep on saying, well, you need this. You got to have that. That's just uncalled for to me. You either want to help somebody or you don't. Oh, you did. You not got so commonplace. You don't care about nobody. Nothing happened to yourself. Ferguson says she feels like every time she turns around, she's at a dead end. I went to the church. They told me I had to have my ID. All, everything I own is up in this apartment. And you know what I supposed to do? Get in there and pick up stuff and look around for IDs for you. For yet to satisfy y'all that I live in this area. Many organizations require an ID, an address, and other forms of identification. Part of that is to start the process of documenting those who were left with nothing. But Ferguson says it feels as if some people don't care. This is not no scam with, with us, with us on, on Railroad Street. We ain't got nowhere to go, we ain't got no food. We ain't, I'm talking about, we ain't even got transportation. All these places y'all said helping people. Well, we don't get how we don't get there. Ferguson says she just wants someone to point her in the right direction. I went to the Salvation Army. Salvation Army said they can't do nothing to meme or do stuff. So what do us, us, supposed to do? Do we just supposed to lay in the street or just give up? I just want to know. That's all I want to know. If anybody else can tell me some reason, but if for me to do, I would do. A Columbus spokesman tells WCBI that the city is preparing to hand out letters of information to people impacted by the twister, ensuring they know where to go. There are also plans in the works for transportation. The Trotter Convention Center will open tomorrow at 11 a.m. It's a one-stop shop for volunteers and victims. Tornado victims continue to move what's left of their homes and figure out what's next, rebuild or move on. Unfortunately, when disaster strikes, some people coming in offering to help, only wanting to help themselves. Our Riley Livingston is joining us now live with more on what homeowners need to look out for. Andrea, I'm here on Conway Drive, which was hit hard during Saturday's tornado. Today, residents are picking up the pieces and trying to figure out where to go from here. 
And as they rebuild, the State Board of Contractors is urging people to be cautious of shady contractors. Joe Hawkins, an investigator for the board, says homeowners need to be careful. He says don't pay money up front and don't pay cash. Get at least three estimates, and if one is extremely lower than the rest, Look at it with caution. Make sure you get a written agreement, not a verbal one, and only hire licensed contractors to do any repairs. Also, if someone is going door to door, be wary. Um, you're going to see guys coming in with, um, with materials on their truck already, and they're going to tell the homeowner, hey, I just got through finishing a project over here on, this other, on the other side of the street. Um, I have some leftover materials. You know, if you pay me a little bit of money, I can use these materials and, and, and get you going. That's definitely a red flag. If you aren't sure if a contractor is legitimate, you can visit the Mississippi State Board of Contractors website or call 601-354-6161. We'll have more information on what you can be on the lookout for and more numbers to call on our website, WCBI.com. Reporting live in Columbus, Riley Livingston, WCBI News. All right, some important information. Thank you, Riley. The Columbus Success Academy at the former Hunt Intermediate School has been ruled a total loss since Saturday's severe weather. The school holds sentimental value for many Columbus residents and has long been a cultural center in the community. Columbus School Superintendent Dr. Cherie Labat says the immediate concern is relocating the school's usable equipment and assets to a new facility. Dr. Labat also says the future of this site is bright. Are we definitely going to rebuild as my trustees um, understand that this community is important to us. Um, it's important for us to provide not only the services that we, um, we provide to the community, but to our students to rebuild this. Hunt High, are you Hunt High? was the mecca of the community. We did everything happened here. I mean, it means a lot to the community. It was 20th Street was kind of the centerpiece for the black community. And for the Supervisor Leroy Brooks also saying he would like to see the site become home to a new community center or a gym. Well, survivors of last weekend's tornado are not alone in their cleanup efforts. We find out who's coming in to help when we come back. Welcome back, everyone. Neighbors are helping neighbors all across Lowndes County, and that includes business neighbors. Lowe's Home Improvement is setting up shop at First Pentecostal Church of Columbus to distribute disaster relief buckets. The buckets include garbage bags, toiletries, there are masks in there, safety glasses, and gloves. They also donated several cases of water. The folks at Lowe's say the supplies are for anyone who wants them or needs them. You can stop by First Pentecostal Church of Columbus throughout the rest of today or tomorrow to pick up a bucket. Folks from as far away as Nashville are coming to help out the battered parts of the friendly city. The Church of Christ Disaster Relief Program arrived today at the Church of Christ on 10th Avenue North with a load of supplies, things like water, clothes, diapers, food, and other essentials. Will be boxed up, Pastor Willie McCord says. They will hand out supplies until they run out. This is our community. We, we serve here, we work here, uh, we worship here, and we wanted to do it for this community to let them know that we're not just somebody who invites them to church, but somebody who serves them when they have needs. The church will start distributing supplies tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. It's located at 1828 10th Avenue North. Finding friendship during devastation, that's what has happened between two women a Saturday night after the tornado ripped through Columbus. Once it passed, Elette Lowry was standing outside her destroyed apartment holding her two-week-old baby. That's when Monica Sykes spotted the mother and daughter and told them to get in her car. She took them to her home and provided them with a roof over their heads. Our Jory Talley will have more on this newfound friendship coming up tonight at 9 and 10. Temperatures stay mild on Wednesday across our part of the world. We've got some 60s to around 70 here. Warmer 70s to the south. Better rain chances tonight and a, four, and a good chunk of tomorrow to our south. But we still have some opportunities for rain here. We'll talk about that coming up next. Your WCBI First Alert AccuWeather Forecast with Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson. 
All right, everybody, uh, let's go ahead and check out our Alpha Insurance camera downtown Tupelo right now. We do have no rain falling for a change. How about that? No rain here. However, it's been a wet February, 15.48 inches, the wettest February on record, the fifth wettest month ever on record in Tupelo. Now, all that water had to go somewhere, and it, uh, for a good chunk of it, went into the Ten Tom Waterway. And this is some flooding near the uh, Point Harbor area. This is the Clay Lowndes County line right along uh, Highway 50 there. So we've had the water really come on up, but it's beginning to recede. So the worst of the worst, I think, is over in some spots. Not all spots, but in some spots. Let's talk about it. Uh, in Amory, notice how we are looking at the flood stage to uh, really be reached by Thursday. Water is receding. The Budahatchee River near Hamilton gradually receding right here, but it will take through the weekend to probably drain all that water out of here. In Columbus at the Stennislock and Dam, we peaked yesterday morning, but we've lost about three plus feet already, and things are improving maybe by Wednesday afternoon to get more of that water out of here. Lux Palila at uh, Columbus 2 also on a downward slope right there. By Thursday afternoon, we think we should be below flood stage. And at the Bevel Lock and Dam, the last vestige in our area that will deal with this high water is leveling off but by Saturday. It looks like we'll start to get that flood water out of here. No rain in our area. Some showers are trying to pop up on radar. Most of that staying aloft, so we don't really have to worry about it. You can see tonight into our day tomorrow, your Wednesday, uh, fairly dry, fairly quiet, but tomorrow evening and tomorrow night, we may have a little disturbance zip on through here. So that would be another chance for some rain around here tomorrow night. And then as we get into your Thursday, can't rule out some showers around here, but it looks like we probably won't have a lot during the daylight hours. Same story Friday, too. Can't rule out a little bit of rain around the region. More clouds than anything else here for the next few days, folks. But there will be some rain that will be possible from time to time. There will be a front that will slip on in here sometime during the weekend, probably Saturday, Saturday evening. And that will give us some cooler air as we get into next week. So in the near term, we're looking at some upper 60s to around 70 through Saturday. Some rain opportunities here. A better chance for rain by Sunday down into the 50s and maybe only 40s as we get into early next week. There's your forecast. Sports is next. WCDI Sports with Tom Ebel is brought to you by your local Ford dealers. Go further. Just when Mississippi State football thought it was done looking for assistant coaches, think again. Multiple reports saying linebackers coach Tim Labuku is leaving his position in Starkville for a return to the NFL. But that NFL team has not yet been made official. Lubuku is a part of the San Francisco 49ers coaching staff before jo joining Joe Moorhead at Mississippi State. It was already a historic season for MUW women's basketball. Basketball returning after a 16-year hiatus, simply welcoming the team back wasn't enough. Some more history had to be broken. For the first time in the USCAA tournament history, the MUW Owls will be competing for the national championship. MUW women's basketball tabbed as the two seed in the Division I championship, taking on seven seed Carlo University on March 7th in round one. A big day of more broken history in Columbus for the MUW Owls. Here's their reaction to their selection. Well, first of all, I'm blessed. I'm, I'm excited since it's our uh, first time being in the national tournament. And uh, I couldn't be even happier. Oh, we beyond blessed. I mean, we work hard for it, so, I mean, we deserve it. Well, we're very excited. Uh, I knew from the beginning of the year we were going to be a pretty good team. Because uh, we got mostly juniors. Uh, and one, one freshman, uh, two, two seniors that transferred in. So we have a lot of transfer kids with college experience already. Uh, so we, we you know, if they, you know, brought into how we needed to play to win, then I thought we'd be successful. The Owls enter the tournament as the top rebounding team and the highest offensive and defensive efficiency teams in Division I. College baseball continuing today with some midweekers, Ole Miss and Mississippi State in action. The Bulldogs up early on thanks to Marshall Gilbert and Justin Foscue with some solo home runs. Mississippi State would be on top. And then Ole Miss starting a little bit, a little struggle against UT Martin, but 
Death taxes and Thomas Dillard home runs changed that really quick. Ole Miss was in control at last check. We'll recap both these games coming up at 10 right here on WCBI Sports. But plenty of sports all around the viewing area. Mississippi State inside the hump taking on Missouri in a big matchup that could lock a spot in the NCAA tournament. And also high school playoffs continue. But that's it for sports. Last of your weather is next. All right, staying mild for the next couple of days here. We've got around 70 tomorrow, if not that warm, some upper 60s here through Saturday. Some rain from time to time, maybe a better chance by Sunday. Trending cooler next week as we get into March. New month is not just uh, I know. But a few days it's away. weird, isn't it? It is. It has kind of flown by, but that 70 degrees, 68 will feel mm -hmm. good, uh, especially when you look at that 44. Correct. <laughs> yeah. And lows uh, early next week may be down to the mid 20s. So Shiver there you go. Again. I know. Yep. Uh, winter's not going. No. All right. Thanks for joining us.